there, and welcome to Central Texas Gardener. I'm Tom Spencer. You know, although nandinas and ligustrums are as tough as nails, these exotics are invading our native habitats. Well, today, Jared Pica has a few options for plants that are just as self-sufficient, but are much more beneficial to wildlife. On tour, let's visit an early spring garden where native diversity thrived after exotics left the scene. In early March, there is much to see and hear on the land that Paula and Dan restored to its native heritage. By April, the views will be different, and again in September and December. 20 years ago, they bought the land that adjoined the house where they raised their children. Always, this was their favorite backyard. Eventually, they made it their house in the trees and supplemented nature's garden to respect the land rather than altering it with a lawn or flowers all in a row. I grew up in West Texas, and uh, but I spent my childhood years during the summers in these limestone hills west of Austin. And uh, this piece of land just reminds me of those happy childhood days. And so I was able to uh, come back and uh, uh, capture uh, that in a mu very meaningful way. What we were after was uh, a house that had a relationship to the outside from every point on the inside. From the beginning, it was a collaboration among them, the land, architect Paul Lamb, and David Mahler, ecologist and landscape designer for environmental survey consulting. Although they carefully worked around the native trees, David excavated hundreds of invasive exotics. David added native species to supplement the ones that revived once the exotics were cleared. He worked with the natural bluff to build low-impact walkways. Then David designed a cool and comforting grotto that begins the journey down the hill in a series of waterfalls to a pond. It started with Dan's idea of a pond at the edge of the bluff. For 20 years, he'd noted the natural pooling after a heavy rainstorm. Like all great inspirations from nature, it grew from there. From open windows and outdoors, the waterfalls cancel the sound of the highway that carries through the trees. The stream appears to begin in front. Along with uniting the two spaces, it designates the entrance to the house and the front yard living room that Dan and Paula wanted. It has the, uh, the relationship to the outside that we were seeking uh, with the noise of the water and uh, the trees uh, being as close to the house as we could preserve them. In fact, this tree is, uh, if you look on the other side, there are little two by four strips nailed in the bottom of it going up the tree, which is where our son would climb and repel out of the branches <laughs> of this tree <laughs> and, and as a little boy. So we made this tree uh, the centerpiece of this courtyard. <laughs> Another centerpiece is the Thunder House aligned with the compass to hang out in rain or sun and view the front from all angles. Instead of lawn, Dan told David that he wanted to wander trails that are never static. Well, I told him I was getting rid of my lawnmower and I never wanted to see or hear another one. <laughs> I just didn't want to do that anymore. These plants uh, appear and disappear and uh, going through the seasons, uh, one will replace another just as you're 
saying, oh, I wish that plant would bloom a little bit longer. Something is right behind it, showing you something very different and new and fresh. And that's just so much more interesting to me than uh, mowing a St. Augustine yard. <laughs> they did plant native buffalo grass in the septic field, but it's also a wildflower meadow. In early March, overwintering species that bloom from spring through fall are mere rosettes, but not for long. And we don't mow it. It, it just lays over and uh, takes care of itself. To guide the way at night, Paul Lamb designed lights with plumb bobs and colored glass for an unobtrusive parachuting illumination among the trees. The wildlife only needed water and an ongoing food supply to find their way day or night. The animals, birds, butterflies, dragonflies, frogs, turtles, are not attracted to uh, a mown lawn. There's no relationship there. I just think that watching these uh, wonderful variety of plants we have grow and change and evolve over a 12-month period or a 20-year period of time is just something to look forward to. It, it ha it's ever-changing, it's, uh, uh, it's not monotonous, it's not uh, homogenized, it's uh, just the way it was meant to be. And the authenticity of this land is just uh, very special to me. David Mahler is a master at restoring Texas landscapes and what a beautiful setting he has created there for that homeowner. Uh, restoring landscapes, bringing back the natives, cutting back the invasives, that's an important thing for us to be considering. And right now we're going to be talking about substitutes for so many of those invasive plants that come from other places that are really kind of detexifying our native landscapes. And I'm joined by Jared Pica, who is with Native Texas Nursery. It's a wholesale operation here in, in Central Texas that supplies natives to the local nursery trade. Welcome back to the show, Jared. Thank you. Thanks for having me again. Yeah, this is a great topic, and I know that you kind of there. Some of those invasives really get under your skin. They kind of bug you. Why? Why? Why do people care about invasives? Well, it took me a while to completely understand it, but once I bought a house that was overgrown with ligustrums, mm -hmm. I began to understand <laughs> the frustrations yeah. and and how they create a monoculture mm -hmm. of of an overstory, and they they just choke out every other plant at ground level. Um, when you cut one down, all of the seeds from that plant germinate mm -hmm. and immediately grow faster than the surrounding native right. vegetation. Right, right. So it, 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 they kind of they self propagate and they, they take over, and as I said, detexify the landscape in a That's very right. real way. You know, the, the rich diversity of plants that were here are being supplanted by, a, in some cases, just a handful of these invader species, from, a lot of them from Asia. That's right. You know, uh, Ligustrum and Privet. That's the one that particularly gets on my nerves because right. I see it every day. But there's a few others. China berry, perfect. Nandina, you name it. They're all out there. A few vines, Japanese oh. honeysuckle. Oh, yeah. There's the, these things uh, we all, and the, the pity is that I think unknowing uh, homeowners are still introducing them into our landscapes without knowing that there are a lot of great natives alternatives. That's right, that's right. And I think through more education, Mm -hmm. where we're giving people substitutions and new ideas right. and even bringing back some classic plants that we've forgotten about that yeah. work really well. Well, most people buy plants to fill a specific need. They're, you know, let's face it, a lot of homeowners, and they, they might be excited about this variety or that variety, this bloom or that piece of fruit or whatever it is the plant delivers, but really what drives most sales is that, you know, I need a plant to screen something, I need a plant up against my house. That's right, blooms, deer resistant, <laughs> right. all the above. <laughs> right. So um, uh, what we're going to be talking about are some certain situations that uh, uh, people have and, and some native substitutes for that. Now we're going to start by talking about a particular plant that is well known uh, uh, and this is a particularly gorgeous specimen of it. This is Cinezo which is the Texas sage. Everybody knows it blooms purple following the rains. Uh, 
in, in terms of using this as a substitute in the landscape for other plants, how would you use this? Well, it's a good substitute for some of the in, e exotic invasives we talked about, like mm -hmm. ligustrum, yeah. because it, this particular cultivar gets about five or six feet tall, mm -hmm. so it prevents a lot of maintenance also, because yeah. it tops out right where you need it. You're right. It's evergreen. Mm -hmm. It does bloom sporadically throughout the year. Right. So it provides color. Deer, and deer don't eat it. Deer don't eat it, and it's super hardy. Absolutely. You know, um, in, in terms of drought tolerant, this is about as drought tolerant as it gets. I would say that it's wise to water them the first year. Yeah, get them established, mm -hmm. get a good root system going, mm -hmm. and then you can treat them just like they were in Junction, Texas out there. Right, I mean, it's, it's a very good alternative to a lot of plants out there that require a lot more care and are a lot more invasive. Now, a lot of, this is something that you could use up against a house or out in, in a yard as a screen between uh, yards. Right next to it, we have a, a silver germander, and this is a plant that, uh, that you're recommending as a foundation plant. That's right. This would take the place of some of the um, lower petalum, maybe, for example. You're right. Mm -hmm. um, which isn't really a bad plant, but this is yeah. something that, that's a little different. Mm -hmm. The gray foliage is really nice against certain uh, building materials. Yeah. Very drought tolerant. Mm -hmm. uh, deer, again, don't mess with this one. Yeah. And it does get little purple flowers on it throughout the summer. And this is not a Texas native, but it's not invasive at all. That's correct. Um, at the nursery, we do grow some adapted species that are not native to Texas, mm -hmm. but we're very careful to research and make sure that they will not come up in the creeks and rivers around parks and, right. and take over. Yeah, and that's, uh, it's a shame if you go to any of the green belts in town, it, typically what you're seeing are, pl are things that have kind of taken over. We have a couple of other small foundation plants here, that, and this one is one that, I, I, you know, Barbados cherry is the name, and you know, it's, it's hard for people to appreciate how beautiful these little blooms are unless, unless they're up close. But this, it's a really special plant. Uh, the blooms are gorgeous and uh, again, it makes a nice little shrub. It does, and this one can be trimmed, almost hedged. Mm -hmm. It responds well to that. And this was a really good time of year to bring it. it it's in bloom here. It'll be mm -hmm. followed by little red cherries. Right, so that, hence the name uh, Barbados cherry. And uh, you know, again, a, a tough xeric plant, and th I think the more you shape some of these, the fuller they're going to be. So That's right. a little bit of tip pruning occasionally. Promote some branching and right. make them a little more dense. Right. But this is a tough plant that I also like to use in containers, too, because uh, the, get it up on a little podium so people can see that bloom, you know. That's a, right. It has really interesting bark. Um, mm -hmm. Once it grows a little bit more, the bark begins to take shape. and. Yeah. Terrific little plant, so that's one we can recommend to people, Barbados cherry, and a, a kind of unusual one. You don't see it in the nursery trade that much. No, it's becoming available more and more, though. Yeah, and here's another one that's a little bit on the usual side, but I tell you, this is one I see everywhere I go in Central Texas in the woods. You know, this is silk tassel, and um, how would you, you use this in the landscape? Well, there, there's two uses for this. Um, it does take well to also tip pruning. Mm -hmm. uh, you can make it become more dense, almost like a shrub. Yeah. And people are starting to use this for almost foundation plantings, yeah. where you can tolerate something a little taller. Right. You may not want to put it in front of a low window, but. Right, at the corner of a house or something exactly. like that. Exactly, that'd be great. Um, this one doesn't really have much of a, a bloom, mm -hmm. but, but the fruit is pretty. It has nice seed heads. Right. It is evergreen. And the foliage is, I think, very attractive. It's glossy and off, has often a kind of a lot of fluorescence on it. It does, it does. It's, it almost is a little bit like a honeysuckle, mm -hmm. the leaf, but um, it's a very interesting plant that's right, right under our noses all the time, but yeah. people are, are starting to <coughs> propagate now in the nursery trade. You say right under our noses, but we don't see it, and the, our next plant is a perfect illustration of that. This is one called elbow plant, and you tell me it's ubiquitous, and yet, and I, and I like to think I know a lot about native plants in Texas. <laughs> this is one I really don't know anything about, but you're, you say it's everywhere. It is, it is. <laughs> um, on, on pretty much any Texas highway uh, west of 35, when yeah. you're cruising down looking at the live oak trees, yeah. you'll see a mix of Texas persimmon and elbow bush, mm -hmm. just a general green filler underneath those trees. Right. It is, 
it isn't conspicuous. You almost are blind to it because mm -hmm. you don't notice it. Right. But it's part of just that green backdrop that we have that's so pretty on our Texas highways. Yeah, and and here we're going to sort of talk about layering plants in because one of the big th objects or reasons people plant uh, a, a lot of things is they want screening. But often what they do is they go to the store and they buy 16 Photinia, you know, That's or right. whatever, you know. <laughs> That's right. And instead, they could have a rich assortment of natives that they kind of weave together and, and, and layer the plants in with one another. And this is a perfect plant for that. That's right. And um, a lot of our city and government agencies are starting to use that method. Mm -hmm. TxDOT, for example, mm -hmm. is starting to do that along our highways where they'll do a yeah. mass planting of a lot of different native species. Mm -hmm and let them just intermingle and make their own way. Yeah. And it looks very natural, and even though they're deciduous, because of the layering effect, mm -hmm. it does create a really nice screen. Yeah, and, and, in, and some of them are evergreen, like the next plant that we're gonna be talking about, which is evergreen sumac, which has a lot of different uses. That's right, that can almost be a tree. Uh, it takes well to pruning. Mm -hmm. You can make it a dense shrub. Uh, it's a really nice evergreen part of that layered mix. Right. And it takes on a bronze color in the winter time with That's the right. foliage. That's right. It holds its leaves similar to a live oak tree, where it, it, it's not a true evergreen, but it mm -hmm. does hold the leaves throughout the fall and winter. In the spring, the new leaves will push the old ones out, and it'll come out a nice, pretty green again. Yeah, I really like the evergreen sumac, and uh, it can kind of sprawl around, but I think the, the more sun it gets, the more compact. That's the exactly form. right. All right. And next to it is a plant that I think is really underutilized in Central Texas. This is the rough leaf dogwood. And I'd, I'd like to recommend this to anybody who has creek side uh, property where they really want to, uh, they have erosion problems or something like that. But it's also a great screening device. That's right. Along a creek or where it has enough moisture, it, it will sucker and become more thick and almost mm form more of a thicket if you want it to. Yeah. Uh, really, really great for erosion mixed with inland sea oats or something. Mm -hmm. um, in a landscape uh, where you can choose how much to irrigate it, you can control its growth habits a little bit more. Yeah, it's, it's, it's I think, a beautiful plant. Often has beautiful fall color, interesting berries, and kind of an interesting uh, bloom panicle on it as well. That's right, and it's another one that just hides in the woods and we don't really notice <laughs> it, but it's there when you're on a hiking trail. All right. Right, well, lots of great alternatives here, Jared. Thank you so much again for coming back to Central Texas Gardener. We hope that people will look to some of these alternatives uh, and, and stick with what we have here in Texas already and not go to some of the foreign invaders. <laughs> that's right, that's right. So just uh, look up more information. There'll be more information on the way. All right, thanks. And coming up next is our friend Daphne. Hello and welcome to Down to Earth. Well, it's that time of year when we're starting to think about the frost coming up. We may have our first frost very soon. So viewers are wanting to know how to protect their plants from the frost. Gardeners, we think a lot about the weather, and importantly so. We may have lost a lot of our agaves last year, but some of them we were able to protect and keep through the winter, which can be done. It's challenging to do it properly, but it can be done. You do want to cover your plants with a light sheet or a blanket and not plastic. But also, very importantly, you want to anchor that, whatever you put over the plant, to the ground. You want to make sure that no air comes in around the bottom of the plant. That's very important. We are lucky in that it only usually gets bitter cold for just a few hours. It doesn't stay cold, cold for very long during the night. It normally gets cold towards the morning, and then the sun comes up and we warm up very quickly. You do want to cover your plants late in the day and remove that covering the next morning when we get a little bit of sun. We're also lucky in that respect and that our winters are fairly sunny so that you can let the ground and the plant warm back up. You do want to water well around your plants, but you don't want to get the soil soaking wet and you don't want to get any water on your plants. That water may freeze on the leaves. Your perennial plants, you want to mulch those to protect the roots. Things like roses, which you can protect the canes. So go ahead and mulch those up fairly tall with organic mulch if we're going to get cold at night. Your larger plants and your trees can be more challenging, such as the citrus. But if these are well-established, mature trees, they do have a lot of carbohydrates in their trunk system that they can come back from if we don't have cold for very long. Again, you want to cover those with some sort of sheet or blanket, if at all possible, and anchor that to the ground. I know that's not always possible with a tree. Our plant this week is rocket larkspur, Delphinium ajacus. 
This plant was sent in by Melissa at the Zanson Gardens blog, and she has had great success, and I would consider her the mother of Larkspear in our community. She's given everyone lots of seeds. This is an annual wildflower, and you do want to plant it from seed when nights are cool, so this is the perfect time of year. Between 50 and 60 degrees at night is the perfect time for this seedling. The seeds are very small, but they don't have to be exactly spaced across the ground, so you can broadcast them the way you would other wildflowers. These do look best in masses, so something like a meadow area or a bed that you're going to allow this plant to fill in completely. There's a gorgeous range of, range of flower colors from pale to vibrant pink and blue. It does like full sunlight, but can also take full shade. Very well-drained soil is important for this plant. If you want to collect and store the seed for next year, that's easy to do, or you can allow the plant to reseed itself and cut it back in the, in the winter of next year. It gets about six feet tall, very wide, very tall, but only about 12 inches wide. Um, but they do fill in nicely into colonies. So be careful with watering. In the summer, you may notice these plants will wilt, but you don't want to overwater them because then they will rot because there's not much air circulation. To do in this garden, in your garden this week, plant perennial strawberries or fertilize those strawberries if you already have them. We'd love to hear from you. Please visit klru.org ctg to send us your question or a plant of the week from your garden. Thanks, Daphne. Now let's check in with William Glenn for Backyard Basics. Hi there, and welcome to Backyard Basics. I'm William Glenn. It's getting colder out there, and uh, those frosts and those icy winds are going to be upon us pretty quickly, so we want to do everything we can to protect our new plants, and in some cases, some established plants. Um, there's a few tools and techniques that I'd like to go over today to kind of help people to preserve the plants that they've got and to sort of learn a little bit about protecting those plants. Um, it might be stating the obvious to some, but you want to make sure that you're choosing plants that are well suited for your area. It's important that you choose plants from a local nursery, for example, because a lot of times they're going to be buying plants from distributors who are local and they're going to be choosing plants based on the needs of that specific region, as opposed to some of the bigger stores who might buy for major metropolitan areas that are, you know, within 100 miles or so, but in distinctly different climates. Austin, Dallas, Houston are all in different sort of zones. Those are going to be USDA zones, and I encourage you to learn which zone you're in. That'll help you with your plant selection a lot. Also, finding the right spot for the plant in your, in your land or next to your house. Uh, citrus, for example, um, is one of my guilty pleasures. I really love growing citrus, but it's considered marginally hardy, which means that it will sustain some damage. The, the varieties that I have, I, I should say. Meyer lemon only goes down to about 25 degrees, and uh, we sometimes dip below that. So what I've done is I've planted those on the south side of my home which basically my house acts as a buffer between the Arctic northern winds and the tree itself. So it's not going to be exposed directly to those drying, frosty winds. So that's one way just by choosing the right spot that we can really help the plants to thrive throughout our cold winters. Um, another thing that's really important is working some mulch down there at the base of the plant. That's going to act as an insulator for the roots. Two to four inches is usually recommended. And there are a lot of different types based on the plant's needs and your aesthetic choices. Um, everything from straws to shredded woods. Um, there's a whole bunch of different colors of those even just in those two categories. Um, we want to make sure that if we're anticipating a, a frost, whether it be a light frost or a heavy frost, that we we get the soil a little bit moist. Now there is some contention about this. There are some people that say it actually damages the plants and some say that it helps the plants. It seems like the latter has a little bit more research on their side though. Basically a wet soil, not sodden, but a moistened soil will absorb heat better and re-impart it to that plant over the cold night uh, a little bit more effectively than a dry soil will. Um, liquid seaweed. This is just the superstar of botanical supplements. Liquid seaweed contains betaines, gibberellins, cytokines, auxins, all kinds of stuff. What am I saying? I don't know, it's beyond me, but I, what I do know is that this is really going to increase the cellular membrane. It's really going to promote vigor and overall well-being of these plants, thus making them more resilient to some of these cold snaps. A, a strong plant, it just like any other species, it's going to do better when it has a little bit more insulatory material and the liquid seaweed directly contributes to that. 
but our best ally, the number one thing is actually covering the plants. I know you've heard this a lot. It's really important. And uh, what I've brought with me today is called a row cover. Um, there are different brands, many of them, that are designed specifically for the garden. They let air through and light through. They're translucent. So really what they do is they allow a, an environment where the plant can still continue to grow and thrive, but be protected from some of that ice and some of those winds. It's important if the plants cannot sustain the weight of a row cover and perhaps one that might have frost on it, that we build a structure. They can be made out of conduit, PVC, they can be made out of bamboo, they can even be made out of an old garden chair that you don't use anymore. One thing that I always do is I anchor my row cover on all of the sides with these jute staples. You can even do that with uh, bricks, logs, rocks, whatever you want, but the point is to not let those drafts through because they can really damage the foliage. So when we have all of these things working for us, a good moist soil, mulch, healthy plants, well-chosen plants, and a nice row cover or blankets or whatever it might be that you choose to cover your plants, make sure they're supported, um, we're going to protect those plants and continue to enjoy them for the rest of the season. For Backyard Basics, I'm William Glenn. I'll see you next time. Visit klru.org slash ctg to watch online, get more tips, and read our blog. Next week, join us for a special Central Texas Gardener Roundtable with Daphne, Tricia, John, and myself. Until then, I'll see you in the garden. To learn about today's program, watch online, and follow CTG's blog, check out klru.org ctg.